Uh, good afternoon. As you all know, uh, the Adam Smith Society seeks to expose business school students to business leaders who have a deep understanding of the moral and intellectual underpinnings of our free market system. And our keynote speaker today, Harvey Golub, certainly uh, fits the bill. Uh, I'm a fan of the essay that Friedrich Hayek wrote in 1949 entitled uh, The Intellectuals and Socialism because it makes the case for the importance of ideas and think tanks like the Manhattan Institute. In it, Hayek notes that too often business leaders fail to understand the relationship between ideas and subsequent political decisions. As a result, uh, they don't mount a sustained intellectual defense of their own interests. Uh, this is somewhat understandable. Most CEOs are busy running their companies. They don't see the big picture or don't care much about it. Harvey Golub, on the other hand, is a big picture guy. Throughout his long career, he has never shied away from making the moral and intellectual case for the free market principles that built this country and, and our city. He frequently shares his thoughts on the pages of the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Bloomberg Business Week, and on CNBC and other media outlets. As someone who has spent much of his career in the top echelon of corporate America and has employed tens of thousands of people, his perspective is an important one. You have his bio in your program, so I won't go through it all. I'll just briefly note that Harvey joined American Express in 1983 as president and chief executive officer of IDS Financial Services. In 1990, he was named vice chairman of American Express and was subsequently elected uh, chief executive officer and chairman of the board. He retired as CEO uh, in early 2001. Today, Harvey is the chairman of the investment bank and advisory firm uh, Miller, Buckfire & Company. He also serves on numerous corporate and nonprofit boards, including, I am very pleased to say, uh, the Manhattan Institute Board of Trustees. So please join me in welcoming Harvey Gall. Thanks, Larry. Uh, good afternoon. It's, um, it's a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to, to talk to all of you briefly about a subject that lately I've been giving a great deal of thought to, and, and the opportunity to discuss it here has, has helped me uh, develop and shape my ideas that, that I will be um, talking about and pursuing in, in other venues as well, so I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I listened this morning to the, to the teams that were up for who's the, who's the best or the newest or something for the Adam Smith Society, and I realized the number of connections that, that I have. Um, I'm one of the teams from Stern School. I'm a graduate of Stern, and I, I've probably given 40 lectures at, at, at Stern. Uh, there was a team from uh, Columbia. My daughter graduated from the Columbia MBA program and, and is here today. Uh, there was somebody from Brandeis, and my youngest son graduated from Brandeis. And I, he started, he tried to start a, uh, a, a Republican club at Brandeis, and I think they found four students that were willing to, to join. Now, that, that's not the business school, that's, that's the other school. And in addition, I invited one of my grandsons. I have uh, six grandsons, one granddaughter. I can't produce daughters as well as I can uh, sons, apparently. And I, I brought one of my grandsons, who is a budding conservative, and he and I will have a little bit of a dialogue to discuss these, these ideas. Um, so his name is Luke Hayes. Luke, come on up. <laughs> now, you notice Luke has a tie on, and I don't. And that is because I don't wear ties anymore. And he does. He is a, a bit of a uh, uh, gentleman. All right. Um, I'm a conservative. Yeah. And I understand you think of yourself as a conservative. Yes, I do. I, uh, wait, wait, wait. Let okay. me ask you a question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what the answer will be. I know what the, I know what the question is. Um, I was about to say, I know why I'm a conservative. Now, what is it about conservatism that you think you believe in? Why are you a conservative? So I think that I'm conservative because um, I believe that th we should give more power to the people and less to the government, so limited government. Why, and why, why, why? Because the, the people 
they, they actually make the decisions and they can vote on uh, officials. Okay. So I think that it's fair to give the people more power because it, it would make our country a true democracy instead of a democratic republic. Okay. Well, okay. All right, we'll talk about that at dinner sometime. What else? Um, I also believe that uh, free market. I believe in free market. I believe mm. in um, a lot of personal responsibility. What do, you, what do you mean free markets? So I believe that a transaction should happen with, in the economy without government interference because then so the money just ebbs and flows and uh, but, it but stays what, natural. But what if businesses do bad things like dump pollutants in rivers? Well then, they, well then they should be more careful okay. <laughs> about. <laughs> they should be more careful <laughs> about polluting the earth. But what if they're not? Well. Okay, we'll talk about that. Yeah, what, we'll what, talk else? about that. What, what else do you believe in? So, just on a specific issue that I know that you're very passionate about, global warming. Yeah. I believe that uh, <laughs> the, the humans they they contribute a little bit. But it's more nature, and nature takes its path, and every 100 years, it's probably, it's, it's okay to have a little bit of warming, because then it will just go back to normal. Thank you. That's what are the implications of that? Well. <laughs> Can you stop it? Well, you, if it's nature, then you can't stop it, because nature takes its own path. Yeah. So, but if it, or we can limit our, the way that we contribute a little bit to global warming. Okay. Right, we got to develop some of those thoughts a little further. I thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> when I, I, I am, uh, un unlike Mr. Fanny, I am a, a pessimist. Um, it, it, things go on and I see the downside of the world and then I have a conversation with Luke or his mother um, and, I, and I think the world in fact can turn out well. Uh, I'm a conservative too. Now, some of my friends that I don't know really well think that I'm to the right of Milton Friedman and some of my friends that I know really well think I'm to the right of Attila the Hun. So, it, it, and I, I think it's probably useful before I, I, I state what point I want to make, and it's only one point in this, in this presentation, I want to describe a context. Uh, I believe, like most conservatives I know, that free markets are better for more people than governments can ever be. I believe the pursuit of equality of outcomes, we had a big conversation about that this morning, is a chimera and only leads to a worse condition for all. In other words, an attempt to reduce outcome equality will increase it. I believe pro progressives are not evil, but simply misguided, and that the road to serfdom is in fact paved with good intentions. I believe that the only success that has merit is that that's earned by individuals. I believe progressives cannot be converted from what is almost seems like a religious belief that financial success must derive from dishonesty and only benign, a benign technologic elite can effectively government, govern and rule us. And I believe most fundamentally that the pie is not limited and society does not operate a zero-sum game. We do not, however, live in a free market economy in this country. Uh, we have elements of free markets, we have elements of, of capitalism, but the fundamental kind of capitalism that we have is crony capitalism. It is obvious that governments are so large and so perverse, pervasive and influence whatever corporations, business of all kinds do and how they behave. They are such a party to what goes on that what we have are businesses that must take into account how they can use governments, regulatory bodies, legislatures and the like to create competitive advantage for that company or avoid creating a competitive disadvantage for that company. Now, 40 years ago, I worked for, I worked for McKinsey I was, and I was a partner at, at McKinsey. 
And we, we had um, a notion about determining what were key factors for success in organizations. It never occurred to me at that time, never occurred to the firm at that time, to think about influencing governments as a key factor for success in the conduct of a business. Today, if I were an associate with McKinsey doing the same kind of work, I wouldn't think of leaving that off the list. That is, that is how businesses must behave. Now, why must they behave that way? Because through the regulations that, that governments create, through the laws that they write, um, through the exercise of judicial power and misuse of that power, businesses have to survive. So, for example, let me illustrate. What would be the best rate for corporate taxation to encourage economic growth? We, we currently, in this country, as you know, I think as you know, we have the highest nominal rates in the year, the, in the world. The actual rates are somewhat lower than nominal rates. The rate that would give the maximum economic growth, the maximum creation of jobs, would be zero. If every corporation were treated as a pass-through corporation and the, the taxation was based on what individuals took out of that corporation, either in dividends or when they sold stock, and you had a zero rate for the corporations, you would, you would collect the same amount, you would collect actually more, but in the static analysis, you'd collect the same amount of money, and you would have enormous economic growth. And you're going to say to yourself, if that is, that is demonstrably true, it can, be, it can be proven, there's lots of studies that would demonstrate that's a fact, why do we have corporate taxes in the United States? Why do we have a tax system that when I was at American Express, we had 200 tax accounts? Two friggin' hundred tax accounts. Um, we, we have taxes in, 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 that, that are pervasive in all corporations. Fundamental reason why we have a corporate tax system is, is so that congressional tax writing committees can grant or withhold favors, so that they can raise money for re-elections, so that they can pander to their political base. It is not for economic reasons. That is why it, I'm, I am, unlike Fanning, I'm pessimistic about a tax reform because a tax reform that simplifies, simplifies it and, reduce, and reduces benefits means that people who are now winners will be losers, people who are now losers will be, will be winners and they will lose influence and that is not going to happen. The same is true on personal taxes. It's just, a, just a trivial example, as you all know, the largest benefit in the U.S. tax code, uh, other than the earned in income tax credit, is actually for the deduction for mortgage interest. Now, mortgage in, uh, owning a home is a good idea, right? Right? Is it a good idea or not a good idea? I suppose. I mean, I don't know whether it's a good idea or not. If you want a home, you buy a home. Um, but who benefits from a mortgage interest deduction? And that is the question I want you to ask yourself whenever you see something in the political arena of somebody saying, we want to do something, we want to do something to help you, I want you to understand the assumptions that go behind it. The people who are in favor of the mortgage introduction, uh, uh, the, the mortgage uh, deduction, interest deduction, are home builders and real estate agents, and those are powerful lobbies. And those are the people that keep that deduction in place. Who pays for it? Who pays for it? People who rent pay for it. You gotta pay, get the money somewhere. And you all pay for it because the price of the homes, your first homes you buy, will be higher by the, by the discounted value of that amount. So you pay for it. It is not a matter of economics. Now, you could, you could say, well, we want people, somehow or other, we, collective we, want to have a policy that encourages people to buy houses, to live in houses, because it creates better communities or for some other reason. Um, I think the question that you've got to ask is, is that a legitimate function of government? To start with, whether or not it's a good policy, whether, is it a legitimate function? Where, where in the Constitution would you conclude that the government 
should do things that are good as opposed to only things that are necessary. You could make the same discussion with regard to the Common Core. I think you all know what the Common, common Core is. Is it a good idea to have standards for school? Yes, it's a good idea to have standards for school. Is it a good idea for the federal government to apply those standards? Maybe. But is it a proper role for the government to do that? And the answer is probably no. Again, there's nothing in the Constitution, it is a state function, to set standards and run local education systems. So here, here's, what I, here's what I want you to do. Understand when you get into business, you will be engaged in, cap, in crony capitalism. You will act in ways that will violate to the extent that you're conservatives, and I hope most of you are conservatives and will become one, um, will understand, will be in violation of your principles. You will have one point of view about how things should happen, and you will act in a way that violates those principles because you will have to survive in a competitive environment. Don't let that, though, change the underlying belief of both what the, how the nation has to change and ultimately the world so that it can be different, so that the markets are in fact free, so that people can make the decisions. Because at the end of the day, all of history has proven this. Government institutions can never, ever conceivably be efficient and effective. Government institutions do not respond to market signals, to price signals, and adapt. Government institutions can never change. I'm going to give you, except by expanding power and influence. You will never hear a government that will fail at some task where the solution is not to give the person that failed more power and more money. I want to give you a very small example. When I was in high school, I wanted to be a veterinarian. <clears throat> I did not want to be CEO of American Express. I never really had that as, a, as a, an objective. Uh, I wanted to be a veterinarian. I wanted to be a large animal doctor. So I wanted to work in, at, I was in New York, and I wanted to work upstate New York as a large animal doctor. To become a veterinarian, uh, you go to a veterinary school. There were four, at that time, there were 14 in this country, mostly land-grant colleges. The best was Cornell, so I wanted to go to Cornell. Cornell Agri Agricultural School was the way to get in. In order to become a veterinarian, they want to make sure you're a lar you, you will be a large animal doctor and not handle dogs and cats. So you have to have farm credits. So I had to work on farms. I lived in, in Brooklyn and Long Island, had to work on farms. There are very few farms in Brooklyn, and, and, uh, <laughs> and, and as I remember, none in Oceanside. So how did I get a job on, on a farm? During World War II, when there was a shortage of labor on farms because of the, of the draft and, and the war, there were systems set up and a program called the Farm Cadet Corps that would take boys out of the cities and bring them to farms for the summer to do the harvesting work. It was set up in World War II. World War II was over, that program never, ever ended. I haven't checked, but my guess is that program still exists today and the war is 70 years old. And it is, it is a testament to the fact that government programs do not, cannot, will not die, cannot, will not ever be successful, cannot, will not ever adapt, and that the only solution is to have them do what is absolutely minimally required to maintain a fair and level playing field. And all of you will be playing in a game where the rules will be, you got to count the government as your major customer. All right, I think we have time for a couple of questions uh, or comments or arguments. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Sorry, who's? I can't hear. Hi, uh, Jake Mass from Cornell. Uh, big, big vet veterinary fan. <laughs> um, quick question: we, we heard a lot about income inequality and how maybe that that, that issue is not as big of an issue as we think. 
But I'm interested to hear your thoughts on where individual liberty and property rights play into that argument. I'm sorry, my thoughts on what? Uh, in, on uh, with income inequality, how do how do individual rights and property rights play into that? You know, so even though the one percent is making more, how do we address that issue uh, of fairness and individual liberty? Okay, Amy, did you hear well? I'm sorry. Income and what do I think about income and quality? Right, and, and it's both. I think it's both. I, I think it's both. First of all, it's 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 the it's the if you're going to measure something, measure consumption inequality. If you're going to measure 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 those things, eliminate people who are retired, who are not in the workforce, who or who have not minimally prepared for it. Um, you got you got to say so. What is the right amount of income equality? You want zero, but take money, all the money from everybody in the top half, give it to the bottom half, and everybody will be the same, and the amount will be zero. So what is the, what is the right number? It, it's not even a, an interesting question. And <laughs> it, in, in, the, in the sense that answering the question will yield a good policy solution. What I do know is this, is every Stupid attempt to eliminate or reduce income and quality increases it. It increases it. And income equality is even less interesting than what mobility. Can you move up and down? Not whether if you move up and down you're successful. People, people don't understand when they look at those charts, they think it's the same people in the top 1% that were in the top 1% 10 years ago, and it's not. Um, other than that, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. One, uh, one of the problems is you get older, you don't hear so well. Okay, I'll try okay. to be very clear. Um, one of the things all of us as graduate students have as front of mind is student debt. And I'm just curious what role you see in terms of the free market or if there is a role for the government in terms of ensuring that we have an educated workforce and trying to um, address the increasingly rising costs of a higher education in the United States. Okay. Higher education student debt. What, higher education what? Student debt. Student debt. Student debt. Student debt. Higher education student debt. <sighs> I'm, to, I'm torn. <coughs> it, it, is, it is a huge, it is a huge problem. Um, and it's a problem that's made worse by government action. You know, this is a, you pour money, more money into it, you increase the prices and therefore you have more debt for, for, for people getting out of school. I don't know what the hell to do about it, how we get that resolved. I think maybe we've got to start cutting off the spigot by having the colleges and universities that have the students um, take on part of the, of the, uh, of the debt, loan part of the loan. So they have to have a right, they have to, they have, to have a loss when the student doesn't, doesn't pay off. And there are clearly some, there are some fields of study in which the amounts to be paid off are, will never get paid off. If, if um, you know, I, the latest analysis I saw had, had um, What, what, is, what are the, the tests you take when you go, when you go to college? You get the, that SAT scores. You, if you look at SAT scores and, and rank them by the majors of the, of the students, you find three of the bottom 20, three, three of, the, of the 20 majors studied are in the, that are in the bottom, social work, teaching, and some other kind of uh, happy-feely kind of things. <laughs> Those people will never pay it off. Uh, people who get MBAs will pay it off. People who get engineering degrees will pay it off. People who get law degrees, half of them will pay it off and half of them will renege. That's it's one of the worst credit groups in, in, in the world. Um, the, the doctors will, will pay it off. And that reminds me of a story. I want to get back to that. Um, I wanted to give you an example, of, not of, of crony capitalism, but how stupid sometimes businesses could be. Five minutes, thanks. One, um, it, when I first became CEO of American Express, the corporate card business for the U.S. federal government was up for a bit. And the process is uh, GSA makes a decision about who's eligible, and then you have to sell each of the departments. 
And Diners Club had that uh, business, represented about half its business at the time. And I concluded that I wanted American Express to get that business and crush diners. So, so I instructed our people to negotiate and get a contract that got us that business. We were going to get the business. Now, what's interesting about credit cards, and the government required this. They required that, that, we, that we would allow uh, users of, of the cards to uh, not pay us, and we could not take the cards away. So we could not, we could not take away people's cards. We, we could not stop them from using the card in certain establishments, even if those establishments were a violation of government policy. A trivial example, if a, if a government person used the card at a massage joint, um, we had to accept the charge. Now, when we explain to the government, those policies will result in a higher cost to the government than if we, in fact, could take away the cards and prevent them from using it places they shouldn't. The government said, no, you can't do it. So we had to charge more, a lot more. You know what I mean? Stupidity of example. Now, why, do I, why did my, this example come to me? Because the Department of, of Justice was the worst payers. <laughs> I, well, I don't know. I don't know that. I don't know. That. I don't know that. I, 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 do, I do know what the credit losses were, and they were, they were the, the highest, and, and uh, uh, the court system was, was up there with them. Uh, other questions? Yes, sir. There were, well, there were two hands up, either one. <coughs> Hi, I'm John Greco from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Uh, you spoke a bit about how governments cannot uh, change or adapt at all. Uh, do you think that that's just a function of a Republican democracy, or do you think that that's a trait of all governments? And if so, could you explain that? I think it's a trait. <clears throat> the question was, do I think governments can, can, can adapt? Is it a trait of a, of a, of a republic, or is it uh, um, a broader trend. I think it's a trait that exists in, in all governments which do not have to operate in a competitive environment. Um, and governments do not operate in a competitive environment. They have monopolies over everything they do. So, it, you know, I'm not aware of any government that has been able to adapt on, on its own without some kind of exogenous force. And the exogenous force to, to make a change has to be severe. I mean, you, you, could, you could see that um, in, in the current environment, you could see it in Greece. Um, the, 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 whole idea, the whole idea of a euro is, is really a very bad idea, and Greece illustrates it. You can't have Germany and Greece in the same monetary unit with such vastly different differences in productivity. So you've got, you've got Greece, who cannot, who cannot ultimately survive in the Eurozone unless the Germans continue to support them forever. Uh, they, may or do, they may do that. But Greece is, is, is willing to essentially willing to default on the debt if um, they won't be supplied with more money. But they will not change. They will not change. They will not change their labor laws. They will not change their tax laws. They will not change their social uh, safety net. Wait, I'm, I'm done. Oh, one more, she said. Yes, sir. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Brian Chow from Yale University. So, assuming we um, all agree that, um, that government isn't a solution, but you also concede that you can't convince the progressives um, in seeing this perspective, uh, what actionable way do we have to move the world in the direction that we're looking for, to move towards a world where um, people accept that, that government shouldn't be the solution, that we should um, look to private enterprise um, and, and markets um, to find solutions. Okay, if, I, if I got it right, the, the question I think was, what is it that we collectively can do to deal with some of the issues that I described to make the, and make things better? Yes. Um, <clears throat> well, my number one, my number one uh, uh, thing would be elect me king. 
and I would use a course of force to change things before I converted to a democracy. Um, bar, bar, barring that, which, which, is, which is not going to happen, I, I think people like you all who, who are here um, need to get as much of an understanding about the, the benefits and of free markets and the arguments for free markets um, as best as you can so that you can engage in processes on a local basis that will influence political bodies to, um, to move. I, I, I don't think that there's big things can be done. There, you know, the, th the things like Manhattan Institute does, which is try to get Adam Smith societies in, in all the uh, universities in the country that have at least graduate business schools. My daughter wants to have programs like this in middle, co middle school. Um, if you think colleges are, are liberal, um, you should go to middle schools, and particularly private middle schools. Uh, they, they are about as, um, as left-wing as, as you can get. So I, I think it's actions like that. Now, I've been, I've been sort of in this arena for 40 years, and, I've, and I would consider myself a failure. Uh, I, have, I have tried my best, but I feel like I'm swinging the ax, but the chips ain't flying. Nonetheless, I support Manhattan Institute to try to, to do its work. I support American Enterprise Institute to try and get its work done. I go talk to students um, all around the world. I spend a lot of time with my grandchildren so that they can counter the arguments from their uneducated, well-intentioned friends' mothers. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>